If you grew up on the East Coast, chances are you've had Carvel ice cream. Whether you remember getting a Fudgy the Whale ice cream cake for your birthday, or can recite one of their unique commercials by heart, Carvel made a name for itself with its soft-serve treats that were the accidental brainchild of its founder, Tom Carvel. But how did this East Coast icon get started? Today, we're soft-serving the history of Carvel ice cream. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel and let us know in the comments below what other ice cream brands you would like to hear about. Okay, time to get some brain freeze. In 1906, Athanasios Caravelas was born unto the world. Originally from Athens, the entire seven kid Caravelas family moved to America when Athanasios was only four years old. The family first settled down in Danbury, Connecticut, but they all made their way to the Big Apple by 1920. There, Athanasios would grow up to work a hodgepodge of jobs, from auto mechanic to Studebaker test driver to Dixieland band drummer. But his working life was cut short when he received a false tuberculosis diagnosis at the age of 26. That's too many things to happen to one person. This is a backstory of a folk hero? Not a real person, right? At a doctor's recommendation, he went into the country, where he could breathe some fresh air, and wound up in Westchester, New York. In the year or two that followed, Athanasios found out he didn't really have TB, which was probably a really nice day for him. He changed his name to the more American-sounding Tom Carvel, and he met his future wife, Agnes Stewart. One day, he got the great idea of converting an old beat-up trailer into a traveling ice cream parlor. Sure, plenty of us have had that idea, but Carvel had the cold stones to actually do it. With a thousand dollar investment from relatives, he made himself a state-of-the-art refrigerated ice cream truck. And with an additional twenty dollar investment from Agnes for his initial ice cream supply, Tom began to drive his truck all across Westchester County. Keep in mind, this was during the Great Depression, and adjusted for inflation, that twenty dollar investment comes to about four hundred fifty dollars today. We can imagine how that conversation went. Twenty dollars? For ice cream? Don't you know? It's the Great Depression! This series of programs is being presented to help all of us understand better our advantages under our American way of life. For today's topic, let's join now a group of young people at the National Education Program Workshop in Searcy, Arkansas. Legend has it that in 1934, Tom was driving through Hartsdale over the hot Memorial Day weekend when one of his tires went flat. He was forced to pull over into the parking lot of a pottery store, and he had to sell as much ice cream as he could before his entire stock melted away, a feat he accomplished in just two days. Although the summer heat probably did most of the selling for him. This story has been typically American, and every basic fact in it is true. From that experience, Tom claimed to have learned two things. One, people preferred soft, partially melted ice cream to cold, hard scoops. And two, driving all around town was utterly useless. If he just stayed put, the people would come to him, and he wouldn't run the risk of his ice cream tasting like exhaust fumes. So he set up shop permanently in that parking lot, and he made a deal with the pottery store owner, allowing him to plug into the store's electricity so he could keep his refrigerators running. Yeah, everybody's made a few of those deals in college to run the old microwave. Tom's now stationary ice cream truck was so successful that in the first year alone, it made $3,500 in profits, or about $75,000 in today's money, enough to pay his wife back for that initial ice cream investment and more. And by 1936, just two years after popping that tire, he'd amassed enough money to build a permanent structure for his business, one where he could develop his very own ice cream. Once Tom had acquired a real storefront, he looked for ways to capture the partially melted ice cream consistency that customers adored. Heh, seems like you could just leave it in the sun for a few minutes. He was aware of soft serve ice cream. Charles Taylor, an ice cream maker from Buffalo, New York, had patented the US's first soft serve ice cream maker just 10 years earlier. But Tom wanted to develop a machine all his own. So he formed the Carvel Brand Corporation and, with the help of his brother, invented a new soft serve machine. His machine made ice cream at super low but not quite freezing temperatures, and it would become the first of 16 patents that Tom acquired throughout his life. The dude was like the Edison of ice cream, in terms of collecting patents like baseball cards. 
What's more, using his machine at his own storefront made his ice cream parlor the first in the nation to sell soft serve ice cream. From the very start, Tom utilized all sorts of tactics to draw in more families and kids. For instance, in the company's very first year at their storefront location, they introduced the buy one get one free offer, a deal that has continued in various forms throughout the decades. They also lured kids in with comic books, ice cream eating contests, and a young girl beauty pageant. Little Miss Half Pint Beauty Contest is back in your participating Carvel ice cream stores. Nothing to buy, no charge for registration. The children must be between two and five, register between May 2nd and June 5th, and the finalists will be on their own float, such as this one, in the Orange Bowl Parade in Miami, Florida. That's not bad for kids that haven't even reached five years of age yet, is it? Sign us up. Still, none of these attractions could compete with Tom's ultimate creation. As Tom's business faced lulls and downtime throughout each day, Tom looked for ways to keep his employees busy. His answer? The ice cream cake. A dessert made by layering together ice cream, whipped cream, and sponge cake. It's the turducken of desserts. All you need to do is deep fry it. Consequently, many people credit Tom with the invention of the ice cream cake. However, others have pointed to ice cream cake recipes that date back to the 1800s. Regardless of who first made this freezing delicacy, refrigeration was still up and coming into the first half of the 20th century, and Tom was able to take advantage of the growing technology and turn a North American oddity into an all-American staple. Even with all of these advances on the home front, Tom would often leave Agnes to run their store while he traveled the carnival circuit, selling his ice cream all across the nation. But as his product grew in popularity, Tom turned from ice cream salesman to ice cream machine salesman. And he moved on from the carny lifestyle to focus on selling his patented ice cream machines to parlors and restaurants all across the nation. But the machines were confusing to operate for most people, so Tom would have to spend time in each new customer's business in order to teach everyone there how to use his machine. On top of that, Tom's machines cost a lot of dough, which, as you may have noticed, is not an ingredient in ice cream. Many of his customers began defaulting on their payments by the late 1940s, and that was a whole new problem. In 1949, Tom decided that enough was enough, and he concluded that his best way forward was to do a little thing called franchising, a business practice that was fairly uncommon and relatively unheard of at that time. Remember, this was over a decade before Ray Kroc had ever heard of McDonald's. By franchising, all of Tom's machines could be under his corporation's umbrella. He could train entire teams to know about and spread the secrets of his success. To help with this training process, he converted an old motel into the Caravel College of Ice Cream Knowledge, which was also lovingly called Sunday School by its attendees. Huh, an old motel. Yeah, those stains in the carpet are definitely not soft serve. While there, students would participate in an 18-day series of courses that taught them everything from making ice cream to advertising for their particular locations. They were even given the company's in-house magazine, The Shopper's Road, which filled them in on the most recent developments in travel, cooking, and marketing. Sadly, it appears you can no longer subscribe to this magazine. And before the decades closed, the first 25 Carvel franchise locations had opened up. By 1951, that number would rise to over 100 locations. Not bad for a guy who started his empire by breaking down on the side of a road. A few years later, another Carvel legend was born, the Carvel Commercials. The story goes that in 1955, Tom was driving in New York City when he heard a radio advertisement for a new Carvel location. Tom apparently thought the ad was trash because he immediately drove over to the radio station and re-recorded the commercial for himself. Fudgy the Whale is back. That's a whale of a cake for a whale of a dad. It's your participating Carvel ice cream store, yep. And this year your Carvel dealer makes them loaded with fudge and nuts. And you can get fudgy with an ocean to serve 20 people. But if you want to send Fudgy the Whale to a whale of a dad anywhere in the Carvel territory, you call the phone number that you see here. Thank you, and have a happy day, Dad. From then on, Tom became the voice of Carvel locations the nation over. Shortly thereafter, he became the face of them, too, as Tom soon began to appear in televised Carvel commercials. The company even set up its own in-house production studio, just so Tom would always have a place to advertise their new products. 
he became one of the first ever heads of a company to become the mascot for his own brand, a trend later replicated by the likes of Colonel Sanders and Papa John. He was even later recognized for this advertising achievement by the National Museum of American History, where those Where's the Beef commercials should probably live too. In 1956, the original Carvel location was converted into an ice cream supermarket, where customers could buy holiday-themed ice cream cakes, Carvel logs, brown bonnets, and the company's ever-famous flying saucers. It was around this time that Ray Kroc, you know, the guy we mentioned earlier, approached Tom and asked if he would have any interest in supplying McDonald's locations with his patented ice cream machine. Apparently, Tom didn't think burgers and ice cream belonged together, and he turned Kroc down forcing Kroc to turn to Charles Taylor's 1925 patent. To this day, McDonald's is still a major client of the Taylor Company, proving Tom wrong, one ice cream sundae and double cheeseburger at a time. After a few legal hiccups in the 1960s, including the 1965 U.S. Supreme Court case that saw Carvel successfully battle it out with the Federal Trade Commission over restraint of trade accusations, Carvel would add to its lineup of treats by introducing brand-specific characters, like Fudgy the Whale, a Father's Day special that turned into a national sensation, and Celestial Person. I can make a children's birthday party out of this world because I'm a Celestial Person. A character that was quickly renamed Cookie Puss because Celestial Person kind of sucks. Cookie Puss would go on to inspire the Beastie Boys' debut single, Cookie Puss, along with references and shows ranging from 30 Rock to Archer. Wonder if Fudgy the Whale will be there with Cookie Puss. <laughs> and even an extended rant by Patton Oswalt. One of the things I really miss were the uh, Tom Carvel ice cream ads that were on TV. You know who I'm talking about? In 1989, Tom Carvel sold his business to Invest Corp for over $80 million. He died the very next day, and an immediate battle for his estate broke out. On one side was Tom's niece, Pamela, along with his widow, Agnes. On the other were Tom's former secretary, Mildred Arcadepane, and attorney, Robert Davis. Apparently, Tom and Agnes had established in their mutual wills that all of their wealth would go into charitable trust funds after their deaths, such as the Cookie Puss Foundation for Kids with No Ice Cream. Mildred and Robert were at the head of these funds, and after Tom's death, they sought to cut off Agnes's money, arguing that Pamela was taking advantage of her senile aunt's wealth. Pamela, in turn, argued that Mildred and Robert were corrupt beneficiaries of a mismanaged nonprofit, an accusation that bore fruit in 1996 when the New York Attorney General filed a lawsuit against the two. They were both forced to forfeit $1 million and to resign from the charity foundation. That's a real shot to the cookie puss. Even though Agnes passed away in 1998, the drama only escalated from there. In 2007, Pamela filed a lawsuit in an attempt to exhume her uncle's body. She had come to believe that Mildred and Robert had been caught by Tom in an embezzling scheme, and that the two had, in turn, caused him to have a heart attack by secretly tampering with his heart medication. In other words, she was accusing the two of murder. Who knew? Ice cream is a serious business. The case was eventually thrown out, though. Pamela's claims were, at the time, declared unfounded and potentially defamatory, and Pamela had to seek other means of acquiring her aunt and uncle's fortune. She never succeeded. In the years since this legal fiasco, the Carvel brand has taken many hits. They have faced fierce competition from the likes of Dairy Queen and Menchie's. And after having peaked at around 850 locations, they now have fewer than 350. Still in 2021, in celebration of the company's 75th anniversary, Carvel ran a promotion where 75 celebrities were each given a Carvel black card. These cards allow these specific celebrities to get free Carvel ice cream for the next 75 years. But not everyone played by the rules of the game, such as Lindsay and Ali Lohan. People who were teenagers in 2003 may remember the two sisters who were given one of these black cards for the promotion but they quickly abused this incredible power and began to lend the card out to both friends and members of their extended family. Carvel saw this as an abuse of the promotion, and they even put out a lengthy public statement that declared the revocation of the Lohan card. Dina Lohan apparently called the police to have the card returned. And although she managed to get the card back, Carvel made it clear that the Lohan card would no longer be honored at any of their locations. How's that for a parent trap? So what do you think? Do you like Carvel's? 
Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other weird history food videos.